first of all, are we, are we in, in crisis? Are we in times of crisis? And uh, it seems that we are. Time Magazine came up the other day with uh, the title um, and already announced the decline and fall of Europe. And this is not visible here in, uh, in brackets and maybe, and maybe the West. Um, so uh, what kind of a crisis are we in? And it is almost an anonymous conviction among economists uh, that the European Union uh, countries, at least the Eurozone countries, are in three different crises. Uh, the problem is threefold, so. Uh, first of all, we've got a problem of uh, debt, public debt. Secondly, we've got a problem of lack of competitiveness, so competitiveness problem. And the third problem we have to face is the banking crisis. Now, those, those three different um, topics and subjects are interwoven those three crises, crises would have materialized independently um, of one another. I just want to, uh, very briefly, I mean, most of that you know, but I'm just going to go very briefly into that. Um, we're talking, first of all, about the public debt crisis. And I only wanted to point out the figures again. Um, and as I said very briefly, this slide uh, shows the annual budget deficit in 2011 uh, in percent of... Um, of GDP of the Eurozone countries. And you see here that this is the three this should be about the 3% threshold according to the Maastricht criteria. And only four out of those 17 Eurozone countries meet the Maastricht criteria 3% uh, annual uh, budget deficit in percent of GDP. And that's Germany here with about 1% one per one deficit. Estonia uh, generated a surplus. Uh, Luxembourg below 1% and Finland approximately 1%. All the others are uh, beyond the 3% uh, margin. Those country, this is here the um, Eurozone average, and you see that even as the, and that the Eurozone countries on average surpass the 3% threshold uh, together, so this is slightly beyond 4%. Um, secondly, um, the overall public debt, and maybe most of you know that the uh, Maastricht criteria provided for a 60% threshold as to the overall public debt in, um, in re with respect to the annual GDP of a certain uh, country. Now, and again here, very briefly, only five countries are below the 60%. Here's the 60% th threshold. Only Estonia below 10%, that is 2011. Only Estonia um, below 10%, uh, Luxembourg approximately 20%, Slovenia, Slovakia, and Finland approximately between 40 and 50% uh, made, uh, made this margin, uh, whilst all the other countries surpassed this, uh, this threshold uh, when it comes to uh, overall uh, public debt. Um, now, if I do have a problem in balancing my budget, there is basically two ways. Uh, either I cut spending or I increase my revenue or both. Um, now, when talking about increasing revenue, and that's, that sh that's going to be my topic today, in terms of a national state, we're talking about, in essence, about increasing tax revenue. And the only measure to achieve that without suffocate um, without, suffocate, without suffocating uh, national uh, business and national economy by raising tax is to enhance economic growth and, um, and thus boosting a national economy's competitiveness. Now, how can that be uh, accomplished? And in order to assess the competitiveness of a, of a certain country's uh, economy, um, at least in three indicators have to be f uh, fulfilled cumulatively. Um, the European Commission came up with a table of 10 indicators. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all 10 of them, but I think at least three of them, and most of the economy, uh, economists will agree, uh, will have to uh, be fulfilled. Low uh, public debt, low unemployment rate, and high GDP per capita. Um, I'm going to slip that, that slide because there's more slides coming up later on to that extent. And I'm going to skip that one as well. Um, but uh, so I'm I come directly to this slide. 
The World Economic Forum uh, set up an, an index, a global ranking of, national, of all national economies. And out of seven of those seven countries he enumerated, Germany, France, Ireland, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece, only four are below rank 30, and that's Ireland, France, and Germany. Um, whilst Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece in, on rank 96 out of approximately 180 countries evaluated um, are doing poorly rather than, uh, rather than better. So there is obviously a lack of competitive, competitiveness in um, certain EU member states. What does the European Union do to deal, uh, uh, deal with it? I'm not going to go into that in detail, um, but um, as we have three crises, I just mentioned those three, uh, the EU strategy to tackle those crises um, is threefold as well. And it tackles the financial markets at first, so tackle the, 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 the topic by a banking union, banking crisis. Um, it sets up a common fiscal policy uh, to facilitate, uh, to uh, stabilize, in order to stabilize national budgets. And thirdly, it uh, develops a European economic policy in order to facilitate economic growth. Uh, but in essence, economic policy is still a national responsibility. This is the EU strategy. So um, I could go through the European semester that would set up the European Stability Mechanism, Fiscal Compact. Most of you will know all this. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, but, I'm, what, but what I'm saying is it's still a national responsibility. It's still a national assignment. So the national gov governments and the national legislature, the parliaments, are asked to come up with solutions for their national economies. And here is um, where I picked Slovakia. I picked the Slovak example. Why? First, because I was responsible at a certain time for our work in Slo Slovakia and did some research. And secondly, because Slovakia is a significant and inspiring example. Um, I think that many countries can indeed learn from the Slovak example and at least to, uh, try to apply partly um, its solutions, in particular in creating employment and just giving families and their citizens something to live on and a, and a future. Um, when I came to Slovakia in 2004, I was stunned by the commitment of the Slovak government um, and, uh, and its strong will to implement the reforms. I had several meetings with Slovak politicians, including Prime Minister Tsurinda, Minister of Finance, Finance Ivan Miklos, uh, and others, but the most impressing and the most impressive meeting I had with uh, Miklos, um, chief, uh, chief economic advisor, a young gentleman called Martin Brunsko, who was 29 years old and had held a Harvard degree in economics. And I asked him, why, uh, what made you think of implementing, um, of implementing those reforms? And he answered, when our government took over in 2002, we had absolutely no chance. We're the poorest country in Central Europe. Um, we didn't know what to do, and no nobody gave us a chance to develop by any means in any, in any time soon. So we thought, just let's try and see what we can do. We came up with our Harvard textbooks, and we looked, up, we looked up in those Harvard textbooks and realized, oh, that's the way economy is being set up. So let's try it and, uh, and try to adjust those principles to our particular situation. So it was as simple as that. Employment, employment, employment was the main uh, issue, and I can, I can show you very briefly why. So the, con the, the Slovak government came up between 2002 and 2006 came up with, an, uh, with a reform program, and the aim was the accession to the European Union. Slovakia had been somewhat delayed in its, in its accession process, but made it nevertheless two in May 2004 with all the other exceeding countries from Central and Eastern Europe at the time. So that was the motivation for reforms, and the accession criteria were to serve as a, as a benchmark. Um, market mechanisms and subsidiarity were the core principles that guided um, 
uh, Slovak reforms, and that independent of any accession scenario. The program addressed several sectors. First of all, it addressed the national budget. I, I don't know whether this is visible from there, possibly not, uh, but I'm going to read this. Um, it addressed several sectors. The uh, first of all, the national budget. The Slovak government wanted to reduce deficit, make it more transparent and conceive a budget according to policy priorities. Secondly, it addressed the, sec the tax system. The tax system should be reformed in those three sec sectors enumerated, personal income tax, corporate ta tax, and sales tax. And the employment market was to benefit from um, reforming the unemployment insurance, the pension insurance, and the health insurance. I'm not going to go into those other reforms now, um, although a lot could be said about those, in particular about the pension reform, which I find uh, really inspiring. But anyway, I'm going to go into the tax reform. And I do um, uh, want to address the 2004 tax reform in particular. The aims were to reduce weaknesses and its complexity, um, was to unify personal income tax and corporate tax, the introduction of a flat tax, to shift the tax burden from direct to indirect taxation, and fourth, to create a founding investment-friendly economic climate. So what was, what was done in particular? By 2003, those taxes uh, being listed here on the left didn't exist at all. Industrial tax, church tax, wealth tax. And they did not, and they did not introduce that either. With the 2004 tax reform, the following taxes simply were abolished. Um, this, the taxes on dividends, inheritance tax, accessions tax, and real estate transfer tax. And the Gindig principle was effectiveness. I do have five minutes? Yeah, yeah, you can. Try to do, I try to do what I can. Um, even Miklos, uh, at the time, uh, Slovakia's finance minister was here in Brussels last year. And um, uh, he participated in the conference and, hi and he explained why they did away with those tax taxes mentioned. He said, when we carried out a cost-benefit analysis, uh, we realized that some of, in some of the cases, the administrative costs were higher than the revenue, uh, for instance, in inheritance taxes. So we, we simply abolished those taxes completely. The principle was an instrument that uh, is ineffective should be abolished. Um, tax reform, and that, this is the core uh, of the tax reform. It was the income tax reform. They introduced a flat tax before they had a, a progressive tax system up to 38%. This came down to a flat tax of 19%. They raised the tax exempt amount to 2,100 euros per year. Wouldn't, doesn't seem a lot for us, for, for Slovaks it was. Um, I'm gonna, I was going to skip that since I do have four minutes left. <laughs> um, um, and they shifted everything to uh, indirect taxation. VAT was lifted up to 19% and they uh, increased excises. Um, now, did those tax cuts do any harm to the national budget um, and increase public deficit? No, to the contrary. Uh, this chart shows the development of the national budget from 2000 to 2010 in percent of the national uh, GDP. So the reference figure, mind you, is the annual GDP. The blue column here are the revenues, the white one, the expenditures, and the red one, in particular important, is uh, the public deficit, always in percent of GDP. Whilst revenues and expenditures in, uh, in percent of GDP dropped from 2000 till 2008, as you see, year by year, the more important fact is that overall public debt and overall public deficit decreased sharply from, 50, from over 50% to approximately 30% in 2008, um, and that's obviously due to the reforms that have been undertaken by the Tsurinda government. As I said before, hang on, and here we see the Tsurinda government. That's, that's weird, I don't have this. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it makes things even more, more visible, maybe. Uh, so this is the time when the Tsurinda government was, a, was in power. Um, 
this is, well, this is not the only indicator, as I said before. Uh, so let's, uh, let's look into the GDP growth rate. And GDP growth in Slovakia, this is the red graph, was very, very moderate in 2000. Um, it ro then rose to approximately 4% in 2002 and stayed there until 2004. And then it soared to 6%, 8%, and over 10% uh, by the year 2007. As a consequence of the takeover by the Fico government in 2006, and then, of course, the subprime crisis, you see that... Um, that the, um, that the GDP growth rate fell significantly. So the GDP growth rate, the GDP developed uh, as well, along with reducing public deficit. Um, Surinder government, again, with those weird arrows. Okay, annual public deficit in percent of GDP. Did that come down as well? It did. In 2000, and, um, this table shows the level of uh, Slovak public indebtedness between 2000 and 2010, and you know that 3% is the Maastricht uh, threshold. Now, while in 2000 the public debt level was over 12%, um, that, came, that came down to 6%, and later on to a little over 3%, and then below even 2% uh, of annual GDP, again influenced by the measures taken by the Tsurinda government. It then rose again as a consequence of subprime after 2008. Uh, Gone as Tsurinda government. Okay, I'll skip it. inflation. Um, and this is the most impressive slide. It's going to be my last one. Um, and this here comes the most impressive slide. As I said, employment, employment, employment was, was, the, gen was, was the major aim of those reforms. Um, Slovakia had a lot to catch up, as this diagram shows. Um, in 2000, the unemployment rate was a little below 20% and stayed there until 2002. You can see that here, again, Slovakia being the, the red graph. Afterwards, it started to fall and went down to a little under 10% uh, in 2008 before it rose again in the aftermath of, of subprime. So the Tsurinda government managed to decrease the unemployment rate by more than 1% per year, a record really hardly heard of. So do we have the arrows? We do. Um, so as a conclusion, all decisive indicators are pointing to the overwhelming success of the Tsurinda government um, reforms. I don't claim that uh, every single measure is suited for every single national uh, economy. But I do claim that national governments uh, are not incapable of changing uh, its society's fate or that they are impotent uh, when it comes to improving the citizens' living uh, standards. This has been shown impressively by the Slovaks and the Tsurinda government. And when states in trouble do want to generate their, uh, uh, do want to generate higher tax revenue by enhancing their economy, Slovakia might be an example to follow. Thank you very much.